Well, let's move on so we can get to our presenter. Um, I don't know if you can see this poster from where you're sitting. It's kind of interesting. It says, Mixing Birding and Bird Photography. Kind of sounds like mixing texting and driving or drinking and driving because it says, and living to tell about it. So it might be an interesting uh, program tonight. So I'm pleased to introduce tonight Clay Taylor. He started as a race car photographer in Connecticut. And when he started birding in 1975, his first views of birds were through the viewfinder of a Nikon camera and 500 millimeter mirror lens. Going on his first pelagic trip convinced him to buy a binocular as the camera was not very well suited for pelagic birding. Thus began a very enjoyable lifetime of both birding and bird photography. He served as the president of his local Audubon chapter, was the founding president of the Connecticut Butterfly Association, has led birding tours throughout the U.S. and into Costa Rica and Trinidad, and still occasionally gets to photograph race cars. In 1999, he was hired by Swarovski Optic North America to be their birder and attend birding festivals across North America. Sounds like a really hard job. <laughs> Get paid to go to birding festivals. With, uh, good with good toys. Yeah, the best. Um, he moved to Corpus Christi, t uh, Texas in 2008 to escape winter and to trade my Blue Jays for Green Jays. Sounds tough too, doesn't it? Please welcome Clay Taylor. Thank you, Eric, for inviting me. Um, this is, what, my third or fourth time coming up here to Prescott, to the Jays Bird Barn. I met, met Eric years ago. Right when, yeah. Oh, oh, it was Atlanta. It was Atlanta Birdwatch. Oh goodness, yeah. So that that was quite a while ago. Yeah. So um, great to be here. Um, just to just to do some follow-ups on that, we are getting many of those same species in West Texas right now. Um, Cassin's finches, uh, Williamson sap suckers, all that stuff. So I'm I'm hoping that we get some good co good cold fronts to bring them down to Corpus Christi or at least maybe to the hill country so I can put them on my Texas list. And I do have a sighting, so when I was driving back down 17, uh, at around between, between mile marker th 315 and 314, I saw the white red-tailed hawk. And he's not leucistic, he's albinistic, he's white, he's gorgeous. So I might go try and take pictures of him tomorrow afternoon. Anyway, okay, so. Um, I started out as a photographer, became a birder, and somehow managed to keep the two of them distinct yet robust, if you will. Um, adding, mixing birding and photography is tricky because you're, you're, you're playing to two different masters here. Birders want to look at stuff. Photographers want to stalk stuff. If you've ever done a, a field trip where you had you know, a, a dozen birders and three or four photographers, they each want to go in different directions. And, and you know, so it, it can, a lot of the big bird tour companies now do birding photography tours and birding tours, and they ask you, are you going to take pictures on this birding tour? If you do, make sure you don't be bringing big telephoto lenses and big tripods and all that stuff. Anyway, okay, let me, let me keep going. So there's me. Um, the shot down the bottom is uh, uh, down on the San Diego River in San Diego, California at the Bird Festival, which is a wonderful festival. Um, the one up in the upper right, I am in, oh, down by Palm Springs, California, chasing Lawrence's uh, uh, goldfinches. So let's see if this works. Ooh, there it goes. Uh, what, t what I took pictures of before bird watching, uh, drag racing. I've got life birds at drag strips, actually. Uh, what I mostly take pictures of now, uh, all kinds of stuff. This is a little blue heron in San Diego. Uh, back in 1975, how many people remember film? <laughs> how many people miss film? <sighs> I don't at all. I do not miss film. Anyway, 35 millimeter film cameras, manual exposure, manual focusing. So I, I, I don't have any sympathy for modern photographers today who go, you mean I have to manually focus? Yes. It's a spotting scope. Anyway, we'll get to that. Um, the worst thing was about film was you had to wait two weeks to get your slides back from Kodak, only to find out that you messed up, um, set the wrong ISO, you know, whatever. Um, you know, the, the wonderful thing about digital now is when you screw up, you know it immediately, and you at least have the chance to recti <coughs> excuse me, rectify the mistake before the bird flies away. Okay, so my old system, I had an old Nikon F. I took this one off the Internet. Uh, I had one exactly like that. 
Um, I also had a, whoops, I started with a Sigma 500 millimeter F8 mirror lens. That was my first one, and that actually did take that picture right there. Um, I, I eventually had a whole bunch of different uh, telephoto lenses uh, over the years with the film, um, but it was just, you know, it was film. It was annoying. Um, along came digital point and shoot cameras. And this is a little slideshow that I put together, oh goodness, back in 2001, 2002, just showing what you could do with a digital camera and a spotting scope. So this is on Honeymoon Island, Florida. Um, hold the little point and shoot camera up to the scope eyepiece and you get that. Zoom the lens and you get that. And you can even crank it all the way up to maximum power on the scope and maximum power on the camera and get the equivalent to a, a oop, why is this thing going on by itself? Hmm. I'm not touching it. Is this thing on a timer? Oh. Okay, anyway, let me back up. So, th that was what you could do with point and shoot cameras. A uh, red tail hawk out in the field, you could get a very nice picture of a red tail hawk, but if you start looking more closely at it, look at the details. We, we'll see, there's, oh, there's my little. So, details here, that spot in the eyes, well, this thing is, is going all by itself. Hmm. Can we look at the um, the PowerPoint and see if there's some kind of a timer got actuated? Please, thank you. Um, anyway, so one of the problems with, with doing super telephoto photography was making sure you had everything, sh um, okay. He's got a. Oh yeah. Computers can't live with them, can't live without them. Can we good? Hopefully, Hopefully. okay. Um, so the big problem we had with, with digiscoping was, yes, you could do identifiable shots of, of birds and things like that, but to get really nice pictures, nice prints, you had to look at the little stuff like, you know, was the spot in the eye a spot or was it a little line or was it a squiggle or a Nike swoosh, which means that the, that the fine details were gone. Um, when we figured out that we could do digital SLRs on the spotting scopes, that made things a little bit easier. So here's a, uh, um, so there's the, there's the, the normal end shot. There's the, through the scope and, you know, cranking up the power to about a 2750 millimeter lens. And, you know, you could do all kinds of neat things. Um, that was the old system and it kind of sort of worked. It was kind of a pain in the neck. Um, you were screwing things onto the front of your lens and hanging your camera off the back of the lens and, and things like that. But I got good pictures with it. Um, I love doing birds and sunrises. That sunrises and sunsets with birds are just a blast. I, I do that all the time. Um, I still have yet to get that great eagle shot again in the, in the tree silhouetted against the sun. I'm still waiting on one of those. Um, but high five or is it high four? I guess it's four. Uh, that's actually my, at my hummingbird feeders in, in Corpus Christi where we get, you know, uh, invaded every, every September with three to four hundred hummingbirds, which is a blast except for you have to mix up all that sugar water. This is the famous gator farm in uh, 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 St. Augustine, Florida, where the alligators are breeding and then the trees above them are all the egrets and herons nesting because that way the predators, the raccoons and stuff, don't climb the trees because they get eaten by the alligators first. So it's a wonderful place for photography. I was in California. So I very rarely do stuff in, in shoot, shooting out of blinds. I, I'm a, I'm a run around and take pictures kind of guy. This is actually shot from the car down in South Texas. If you've been to uh, Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge, this was on the wildlife drive. And that's white-tailed hawk, which is our, do you have, you guys have white-tailed hawks in Arizona? Southeast Arizona, Southwest Arizona? In the Chiricahuas, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the South Texas specialty and I can get them flying by my house every so often. Um, who's been to Bear River National Wildlife Refuge in, in Utah? Awesome place. Shot from the car. That's a little violet green swallow doing some maintenance. I do get around. Um, Blue Crown Mot Mot down in Costa Rica. Now they changed the name of this thing, and I th I'm trying to remember what the name of it is. It's something weird. Lessons. Lessons. There we go. Very good. Thank you. Um, uh, that was taken at uh, Monte Verde Cloud Forest. Uh, oops, come on, you. There we go. Um, scintillant hummingbird. This is a little tiny guy. This is this is actually smaller than ruby throat, uh, and that's at a place called Savegre Mountain Lodge in Costa Rica. That is absolutely one of the most fabulous places you can ever go for birds and 
lodging and stuff like that. I love it to death. And fiery throated hummingbird at a little restaurant that's right on the uh, the main uh, Pan American Highway going through Costa Rica on the area known as um, Sierra de la Muerte, the the mountain of death. But it's wonderful for hummingbirds. Uh, this was actually just a grab shot. That's uh, McGillivray's warbler. I was up in uh, Washington State doing some other stuff with a friend, and he popped up, get a shot. So you can do, so I, I'm shooting mostly with the spotting scope nowadays. I mean, I have, I still have a 400 millimeter and a 500 millimeter and a 600 millimeter lens, and I, I can't even think of the last time I used them. Because for me, I'm birding, and I'm doing photography, so why not do the best of both worlds? I may do my pictures through my spotting scope. Um, that way I can look at stuff, and then when I need to get a picture of it, the camera goes on and I take a picture. Um, well back when I started birding in 1975, I was a college kid in, in Rochester, New York. Rochester, well, th didn't they used to make some kind of camera stuff in Rochester years ago? Yeah. So all the guys that were birders were Kodak employees. There were only two of us that carried cameras, and I was one of them. Um, because back those days, when you did birding, you had a little notebook, and you pulled it out, and you wrote down all your species that you saw, and you did little sketches of rare birds, and you submitted your sketch to the rare bird committee, and they judged you on your artistic skills as to whether you really saw that bird or not. Whether you did or not didn't really matter. It was how, how artistically in inclined you were. And here I am taking pictures and, and you know, giving them prints, and they're all looking at them like, photos? Really? Oh, yeah, and that's the bird. Um, nowadays... If you have a rare, rare bird sighting and you, and you write it up and send it into your rare records committee, the first thing they ask you is, where's the picture? Uh, we've we've, we've kind of done a whole 180 degrees now because everybody's carrying a camera. This one. I was just trying to go into a sporting event the other day and they're giving me grief about one of my SLR camera took video. I said, dude, every person in this place has a video camera on them. <clears throat> so, we can also do pictures with cell phones. You're going to see that coming up. Oh, Cedrin. How many people have seen Cedrin up close and personal? That's a tough bird. Um, I, I live, I, when I moved to Corpus Christi, we've got an area, a little, little county park, right about half a mile from my house, that is also the, the major hawk watch migration spot. But get down there, and right now the sedges just came in. So you go down by the little pond, you just sit there and you play sedge wren tape once on your phone, and they come bombing up in front of you from as close to my, as my scope to as close to the, uh, um, to the projector to as close to that lady's knee. I mean, they're, just, they're all over the place. It's wonderful. Um, so uh, Texas is, is I, I really like Texas. I, you know, I grew up in Connecticut. A lot of things about New England that I like, but Texas is just awesome. Uh, this was in Florida, and that's not fog. That's actually blowing sand. The wind was blowing about 50 miles an hour, and it was the the the, the uh, royal turns were all hunkered down on the on the sand on the, on the on sandy beach, and it was just bombing by them. I ended up I'm hunkered down next to a little little dune, and eventually, after about 20 minutes of shooting pictures, I got up, and the sand literally fell off of me, and it was all over my camera and all over me. Um, it was it was quite the chore getting getting uh, cleaned up. But if you blow that picture way up, you can see it's all little, little tiny individual grains of sand going there. But I think it's just kind of a cool shot. Oh, Klamath Falls, Oregon, one spring. Uh, the ringbill gulls were in high breeding plumage. You don't see that very often. Uh, Antelope Island in uh, Utah, Western Meadowlark, just doing his thing. That's shot from the car. I do a lot from the car. Uh, it drives me nuts when you go to a national park you're driving down the road at whether, which, whichever national park, insert one here, and you see a whole knot of cars up ahead of you. So you know there's something up there. There's an elk or moose or grizzly bear or something. And you get up there, and everybody's out of their car trying to take pictures of it. Say, you know, idiots, stay in the car because the animals don't mind the cars. They don't like the people. So yellowhead blackbird. I like that shot. I like that bird. I'm still waiting to get that on my yard list in Texas. And we, we tend to kind of ignore some of the common ducks, and shovelers are actually very, very pretty when you, when you get them in the good lighting. And my second favorite duck of all is ringneck duck, and you can actually see, if you look at just, oops, back up. If you look right about there, you can actually see the little chestnut ring around the neck. How about that? <laughs> kind of, sort of. It's there. It's there. Um, this was actually taken with my old, uh, my old Pentax K100, so that was a probably, a, 
I think an eight megapixel, eight megapixel camera. And back in the office, we, we literally have this one blown up to about that size on the wall. And it's a very cool picture. So you don't, the, the whole megapixel arms race in the, in the camera industry is kind of much overhyped. You can do very well with not so sophisticated and not so modern stuff if you know exactly how to use it. Uh, American Oyster Catcher, this is on the beaches. One of the cool things about Corpus Christi, Texas, we have 45 miles of beaches you can drive. 45. And just get out there and make sure you've got four-wheel drive on some of them, but uh, you can just, you're, you're 10 miles from anywhere, no cell signal, but the birds just kind of ignore you because you know, they don't see you very often. Uh, this is back to Bear River. Um, we were there in spring for their fest for their bird festival, the Utah Bird Festival, and for some reason, all these carp, oops, back up, there it is, all these carp were in the super shallow waters and all the white pelicans were crowding in there, and uh, that, that's kind of a big old thing to try and eat. That, that it, was, it was kind of interesting watching him flail and thrash, and, and I, I, he never did get it down, but it was, it was kind of neat watching him. Um, I also do other stuff besides birds. So this was taken uh, from my uh, uh, hotel balcony at uh, about, this is, the, uh, this is in Phoenix. So this, near, this plane is 1.4 miles away and that plane is two miles away, taken from my, uh, coming into Sky Harbor. Um, I probably was sitting out on the balcony for like an hour and a half shooting pictures of the airplanes coming in and out. I was waiting for the knock on the door, but nobody, nobody said anything about me, I guess, so. Um, People say, hey, you got to send that to Southwest. I said, no, whatever. I love taking pictures of stuff. I don't like doing things with pictures. Um, this was actually, this is literally from, again, another hotel balcony. This is in Atlanta and the airplane landing at Hartsfield in, in late in the afternoon and in the sun. I only got two planes that came in front of the, came in front of the sun, and that one's a kind of cool one. And that's my favorite one of all. I was actually photographing the moonrise, and I saw the plane coming, and I said, oh, this is going to be cool. So I've got a six-shot sequence of him flying across the bottom of the, of the moon. That was in Portland, Oregon. Which doesn't belong and why? One, two, three, four. This was at the Hawk Watch uh, near my house. Not only do we get hawks flying by, we get huge numbers of white pelicans, huge numbers of uh, anhingas, um, wood storks, decent numbers of things like, oops, like, oh, come on, like the roseate spoonbills there. Um, it's, a, it's a very cool place. We see usually about a half a million hawks a year there, um, and uh, it's, it's kind of cool. Red-shouldered hawk flying over the Hawk Watch. This was first thing in the morning at the Space Coast Bird Festival in Titusville, Florida. And how many of you know Kevin Carlson, the photographer, author, and all that stuff? He's got the Shorebird book and all that. Um, Kevin was, was over with getting his, uh, his field trip ready for the Shorebird identification, and I was over on the other side of the parking lot with my field trip for doing uh, f scope photography. And the sun just broke through, and these white pelicans flew by, and I shot the pictures, and I looked over at Kevin, and I waved, and he's going, because all of his stuff was still in the car. So always be prepared. <clears throat> That's actually South Padre Island, Texas, and that is not docu doctored up at all. There's no Photoshop going on there. So we have white pelicans and brown pelicans and sunsets, which is one of my favorite things to do uh, is, is the South Padre Island uh, sunsets because yeah, every day you get something really cool. Um, this one was California, and I call that the field guide shot. What else do you need to know about cinnamon teal? It's right there. Come on, there we go. Not just birds. How many people have tried to photograph flying dragonflies? Me. <laughs> um, dragonflies will do, especially when they're in. The, they have a breeding season too, but they'll they'll patrol. They'll do a little area, and they'll stop, and he'll he'll sit there, and he'll hover and scan for for uh, males and coming in those areas. So just like everything else, you just kind of get the camera and the scope ready and fire away. The wonderful thing about digital. Doesn't matter whether you take one picture or 100 pictures. Doesn't cost you any more. With film, it was 35 cents every time you push the button. So here I can take 500 pictures of dragonflies, and if 496 of them are awful, I hit the delete button, and I've got four good ones. And those are the only ones I show you. Yes. Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I also do butterflies. Uh, uh, like Eric said, I was the founding president of the Connecticut Butterfly Association, so do that with a scope too. Um, the, the hummingbirds were not out in the rain. That was actually the lawn sprinkler hitting the, uh, hitting the feeder, so I thought that was kind of neat. Oh, let's see, where was that? Oh, that was Palm Springs also. Yep, little Verdon. I do miss seeing, we get, we get rose-breasted grosbeaks flying through Texas on migration, but this is, this is from back in the east where I used to have them nesting down the back end of my property, so uh, I do kind of miss that bird. And that one was taken um, this past spring in Texas. So we got a couple different types of cameras here. That's the old Olympus EP2, a little, little 8 megapixel. This is the 16 megapixel uh, uh, Panasonic. So we've got some other comparison shots coming up that will be interesting to you, hopefully. Um, I love that shot. The friends of mine live in uh, Rogue River, Oregon. And we used to go to a wonderful little bird festival back in, uh, um, in March. And um, I'd go to their house, and everything would be flowering, and, and sitting in the, again, sitting in the driveway, in, in the car with the scope, and little orange crown warbler just kind of popped in and framed himself right in the little flowering uh, fruit trees. Okay. Um, so th there's a lot of things you can do with your camera and birds. You know, if, if you want to get pretty pictures, that's one thing. But I mentioned before, you know, there's ID photos. You know, you, you want to you prove you saw what you said you saw, or you saw something you have no idea what it is, so you take pictures and you put it up on the internet and say, hey, what the heck is this thing? So, uh, Corpus Christi bird counts, um, I do, the, these are just shots from, from 2009, uh, you know, we had a green kingfisher, we had a, a yellow-throated warbler, a uh, peregrine falcon up on a power pole. Um, little winter wren, actually, for, for, for South Texas, that's a pretty good bird. So all these, you know, I didn't have to write up any reports. I just submitted the picture and said, here it is. Um, different South Texas Christmas counts. You don't necessarily have to have the best picture in the world. It just has to show the details. So um, yellow-headed blackbird female in, in with a flock of about 3,000 uh, red-winged blackbirds and, and great-tailed grackles and cowbirds and all that stuff. Uh, let's see, oops, there we go, uh, olive sparrow, this was in a spot where they weren't normally seen, I have olive sparrows not too far from, from me, and actually they come into my yard on occasion, uh, little rufous hummingbird, and I know it's a rufous because of the, the, the outer tail feathers would have been much skinnier if it was an Allen's, so again, photo saves the day, um, and then a very uncommon bird for South Texas is uh, greater scop. We get tons and tons of lesser scops, but greater scop has the white wing bar that goes all the way out into the primaries, whereas lesser scop stops right about the secondaries. So, um, this, was, this was down in, in farther down in South Texas, grasshopper sparrow, never that common in the winter. Bald eagle, never common in South Texas ever. Little Ross's goose in with the in with the snow goose and the blue goose, and Audubon's warbler, which we get mostly myrtle warblers in the winter down in South Texas. So the Audubon's is the is the unusual one. So there's there's the yellow throat to prove prove I saw what I said I saw. Um, the boys at the uh, this is th these are the only pictures in the entire slideshow that are not mine. This is uh, last year at the Hawk Watch. Um, this Oriole popped up, and um, Earl picked up his camera and fired off a bunch of shots. We we blew them way up and found out that this was the uh, first ever record for Scott's Oriole in the park, which was kind of cool, uh, an immature Scott's. So again, have that camera, because they had no idea what it was they were looking at. When it popped up, they just said, ooh, that's weird. We gotta get a picture of it. And it took us a few days to you know, get, a, get the pictures over, blow them up, mess around with them, and say, yep, Scott's Oriole, cool. Okay, and then along came, ah, the new toys. Um, we'd been using the, the Swarovski spotting scopes, which are wonderful spotting scopes, and then we built a new system that does interchangeable front ends and interchangeable back ends. And while this system was being developed, I had said to the guys in Austria, I said, hey, you know something? 
instead of using these 50 millimeter lenses on our cameras and, and, and doing this really uh, not very rugged uh, attachment system to the scope, why don't we just make our own lens? And they said, oh, okay, we can do that. So they came out with what's called a TLS APO 30. And that was a really cool thing because now, this, so that's, that's me, you saw, there, there I am right there. Um, this was taken by my buddy Bruce Webb and we were down taking pictures and Snow Eager happened to wander around the back behind me. Um, so now we've all of a sudden got a, a, an integrated shooting system. So I don't even want to call this digiscoping anymore. Digiscoping was point and shoot cameras onto spotting scopes and it was a pain in the neck. And this now just locks in place and boom. So now it's really just telephoto photography. So when I do field trips, I mentioned it to the trip this morning, uh, once we've got this, this thing put together and you're looking through it, you take off your birding hat and you put on your photographer's hat and you act like a photographer, you think like a photographer because now that's a thousand millimeter lens that I can zoom to almost 2000 millimeter lenses. And to do that well, takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of knowledge. So off we are into the wild blue yonder. So this is one of the first really cool pictures that I got. This was a common red pole, but it was taken in California. The California had just snuck across the border from Oregon into California, and the, and the California birders were all going mental to get red pole on their, um, on their uh, California state lists. So uh, I've got that one in a print in the back. I've got some prints you can look at in the back. And George Lepp happened to be there. Anybody know who George Lepp is? George Lepp is one of the photo editors for Outdoor Photographer and been a bird photographer and, and just, just a wonderful toy guy. He loves toys. And we've been talking about the spotting scope system and we printed that one out and he, he looked at it and he goes, I'm impressed. He said, that's absolutely magazine quality. I said, you've got a real system now. So George, George is very impressed with our deal. Uh, in my yard, Lark Sparrow, on the beaches at Cape May, New Jersey, a little palm warbler, and he's being illuminated. This is first thing in the morning, and the light's bouncing off the beach sand and illuminating him from underneath, so I know I did not use a flash or anything like that. It was very cool. Now I'm starting to think like a photographer. Okay, so now I'm, I'm doing composition. I'm making sure my lighting is good. I'm, I'm not trying to do ID photos. These, these are the good stuff. Go to Costa Rica, what used to be uh, 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 green violet ear is now lesser violet ear, something like that. They keep changing the names. Also Costa Rica, a little volcano hummingbird, which is the size of that scintillant. Come on, there we go. Um, we led a tour, uh, a bird watching tour to Austria a couple years ago in conjunction with Eagle Optics. And we, we visited the Swarovski factory, and then we went down to this national park called Hohe Tauern National Park. It's in the Alps, gorgeous place. And our, our objectives were snow finch and um, lammergeier. We never saw the lammergeiers. We did see the snow finches, but we pulled into the parking lot, and here was this gorgeous alpine ibex just sitting there. I went, birds? What birds? Who cares about birds? I'm taking pictures of ibexes. Um, I have this in a print in the back, and you look down, and there's little drops of, of rain in the grass and stuff like that. It's just, it's just an incredibly detailed print. Um, and when, when I show this to the hunters, they all about cry when they see that. Um, critters, yes, that was a little um, uh, diamondback rattlesnake that I um, relocated out of my yard. He was in my, in my backyard, and my wife was not happy, so... He got transported about 20 miles to a dirt road. I kind of dumped him out and then took pictures and videos of him as he crawled away. Uh, we do have green turtles in, in Corpus Christi. And this one actually has a whelk snail riding on its back. And it took me about an hour to get the thing to pop up and, and, and for me to get him in, in focus and, and centered and get the whelk snail before he came back went, went back down. I was out on a jetty watching birds. Uh, we also do get... Um, Kemp's Ridley's turtles, but I've never seen one of those yet. I'm still waiting. What kind of fish is in there? <laughs> All right, we can see the nose, we can see the pectoral fin, we can see the... <laughs> so. These are all, all on, actually, the, the last three shots are all out on the same jetty uh, in Port Aransas, Texas, um, which is a wonderful place for bird watching. 
And unfortunately, Port A got really badly hit by the hurricane. Port A and Rockport got chewed up pretty badly. So um, if any of you know those areas, uh, it may, it's going to take them a while to, to get back to something approximating normal. Um, something like, I think, f of 500 businesses down there, only uh, like 50 of them are, are back open and uh, fully half of them were totally destroyed. It was, it, was, it was really ugly. And I was only 45 miles farther to the west, but we were just far enough on the west side of the hurricane eye that we, d we didn't get uh, hardly any, any bad damage at all. So we got lucky. They didn't. Oh, back to sunrise and sunsets. Little blue heron with a fish. And we can do a different little blue heron with a fish. He was literally that close. I did not crop it. Sunrise, uh, Titusville, Florida, uh, great blue heron, and just everything just faded away in the background. It was very, very cool. <laughs> he just looks mad. <laughs> he just looks annoyed. It's like, dude, get that camera out of my face. I had a long day. I just flew over the Gulf of Mexico. I'm standing here on a beach in Galveston, and I'm tired, and I want to fish. Get out of here. And that was actually Costa Rica, pinnated bittern. Very cool bird. Looking like grass. Okay, so um, spotting scopes, big telephoto lenses, manual focus. All, all, the, all the, 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 the big lens guys go, well, my 800 millimeter, I can do flight shots. Yeah, so can I. Common eider. That's in, in, uh, in Rhode Island, about 20 miles from where our headquarters is. Snow Goose. How, how many people have been to Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge in Socorro? Oh, yes, wonderful place. Yes. And there's the crane fly out in the morning at Bosque. I like doing hummingbirds, but I like going the opposite direction. You get all these guys, and, and Eric uh, today up at the Flagstaff store, the winner of the photography contest, had this really beautiful shot of a hummingbird in, in, in you know, frozen action with the flashes and all that. Beautifully done, wonderful shot. I love doing it when, when we show what the hummingbirds are up to. So this is a slower shutter speed, 250th of a second. I've got him backlit, so I'm seeing the light coming through the feathers. I really like doing this. Um, and, and yes, it's, it's kind of a push down on the button and, and let the camera go crazy and then sort out the good ones from the bad ones. But if you pick your certain, pick your situations right, obviously there was a, there was a, there was a hummingbird feeder right over here. So they were hum hovering, coming back and forth into the, into the feeder. And so I was just waiting for it. So I really like doing this stuff. I get a lot of those. Anybody know what that is? Oh, see, it's right, it's right, it's right there. Ooh, Eric, you cheat. The International Space Station, one, uh, 275 miles away. You can actually go on the NASA website, or they have an app, and go on the phone, and you, you, you go on the NASA site, and you can do sightings, and you tell it where you are, and it tells you when the space station is going to fly over and how high up it'll be. So if it's really low, you've got too much atmosphere to shoot through and there's too much heat shimmer. But if it's up about anywhere from 50 degrees to 90 degrees up, um, you've got less air to shoot. And you can take pictures of the space station as it flies over. How cool is that? The ultimate flying bird shot. Um, here's where it gets really interesting. When we get low light, um, there is an app for that. And the cool thing is, like with, with my Panasonic over there, I have an app on my phone that I can run the entire camera with without touching it. So I can sit there and look on the screen of the phone, mess with my exposure, mess with my white balance, push the button, and it takes the picture. And since it's electronic shutter, when I push the button and take the picture, there's no moving parts. There's no vibrations. So you can do some very cool stuff. So this is 1 one twenty fifth of a second in, in the rainforest in Costa Rica. That was, nope, that's not Photoshop. That's, that's the way, way it is. This one I have a print of in the back, and you notice it's ISO 3200. Look, go look at that print, and yeah, there's a little bit of noise there, and I did no, did no noise reduction at all on that thing. It's still one of my favorite shots, and, and not just because of the hummingbird, but also because of the, the, the plant, and also because of the, the spider webs, too. 
And that was a grab shot. We were, we were birding along the road in Costa Rica, and I just looked up and saw that and got about 10 pictures, and boom, she flew away. Broadbill Mot Mot. Again, I have this print in the back, too. Oops. Eck. Darn it. Hit the wrong button. Okay, so this is a, a one. This is a 750 millimeter lens, taking a one fifteenth of a second shutter speed, which you could not do with your regular SLR with the bouncing mirror and the moving shutter blades and all that. So the the Mot Mot was was happy just sitting there. It wasn't going any place. Uh, the light was was miserable because it was the it was the rainforest. Um, but I shot pictures of it right justified. I shot pictures of it left justified. I shot pictures of it. Um, uh, vertical, I played with white balance. I mean, I was there, I probably shot 300 pictures of it just like that. And finally I said, okay, let's see what this baby can do. I zoomed the scope to an 1800 millimeter lens, f22, one sixth of a second. And I was firing it with the phone so there was no vibrations. There were was, there was some shots where he had a beak here and a beak here because he moved his head during the middle of the exposure. But, and I've got a, a print of this also. That's insane. That, that, you shouldn't be able to do this. So the, the new toys are wonderful. Wonderful. Um, but you just have to know how to use them. So, uh, and this one's even better. One half second exposure of a red cap mannequin. That bird's this big. And he was sitting probably from me to that video camera in, in, the, in, the, in the rainforest. And it was toward the end of the day, they were coming in to bathe and to get a shot like that is just amazing. So I'm, I'm having more fun with these toys. I'm having more fun with photography now than I ever did from the 70s and, and, and 80s. I mean, this, is, this is just such wonderful stuff we can do. Okay, uh, yes, you can hand hold the scope. You know, it's, it's a 750 millimeter lens. Um, my Pentax camera has in-body stabilization so I can dial in 750 millimeters or 1,000 millimeters, whatever I want to sell, send the scope to. Um, that was actually taken from the um, whooping crane tour boat called the Skimmer out of Rockport, Texas. We were doing the Christmas count, the Aransas National Wildlife uh, Christmas count, and it was our job to go up the, up the, the backside of the, uh, the refuge and count all the whooping cranes. I think we had 75 that day, something like that. But this one came flying in and, and uh, got the shot. So 1600th of a second gives me nice fast shutter speed, and I get some good detail. Um, yeah, we were um, on a whale tr whale watching trip off of uh, Boston, and, and uh, uh, actually it was out of Gloucester, and um, we we're off of the uh, end of Cape Cod, and this one humpback whale came up, and she started breaching, boom, 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 and on the third one, I was ready for. Her. This is one of those times where I actually had too much telephoto lens. I would have liked to have a little less, um, but that's that's handheld, and um, it, it was it was quite remarkable. So if you're a bird photographer um, or any kind of wildlife photographer, the first lesson they tell you is always focus on the eye. Don't, you know, a, a bird with a fuzzy, you know, un, un, unfocused head and a sharp butt doesn't do you any good. You want to make sure the head is sharp. And then ultimately what you want to have is that little sparkle. They call it the catch light in the eye. Um, so we can do that. This is, remember that, that uh, sedge wren picture I had? Well, I was taking pictures of the sedge wrens so Sedrens were over about here, and I've got my little tape recorder playing Sedren calls, and they're going mental. And I heard this rustle, and I looked down there, and there was the Virginia rail sticking his head out going, what are you making all this racket for? So I got three shots of him, and he, boom, he turned around. That's my best Virginia rail picture ever, and probably will be forever, because I'm not a rail stalker. But anyway, uh, but you got a nice little catch light in the eye. I used to know guys who did slide photography, and if they got a shot where there wasn't a catch light, they would get out their, their jeweler's loop glasses, and they would get a very fine needle, and they would turn that slide over, and they would scrape away a little bit of emulsion to give them a little white spot in the eye. Now we can just do it in Photoshop, and it takes all of three seconds. But these, these, are, these are not Photoshopped eye reflections. Um, White Ibis, this was, uh, again, from the car, um, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Bosque del Apache pulled up to, the, um, to, the, to the, uh, the one main pool there, and I'm in the van, and literally the snow geese were from me to the uh, heating grate over there on the side of the wall. So with my 750-millimeter lens, there was no way I was getting the entire bird in the, in the frame. He was, so, I was, so I just said, heck with it. I just cranked up the, 
cranked up the magnification, and as they were feeding and coming back up with the, with the you know, with the head, you know, there was all kinds of water droplets, and then this one got the little the little garland. So I thought that was kind of cool. Roseate terns are just cool. I mean, royal terns are just cool. I don't know. I I I that's one of those birds I cannot drive by one and and not stop and take a picture. I just I I have thousands of, of royal turn pictures when I, and I will continue to take them. Are you looking at me? That's why they call them violet ears, because they can actually fluff out those feathers on the side when they're upset at you. Who doesn't like owl pictures, right? I mean, owls are wonderful. This is at a place in California uh, where you can drive up and it's a uh, it's some kind of a spot. I can't think of the name of it now. It'll, it'll come to me after a while. Um, but you pay 40 bucks or something like that. They, you wander around. There's just long-eared owls roosting there in the, in the wintertime. Um, so what's better than a picture of a long-eared owl? Come on. Oops. Ooh. There he goes. Ha. Are you looking at me? Yeah. There's a couple more videos coming up, so I better be over here and kick them off. Oh, okay. Thank you. How far away were you? Um, too close. <laughs> uh, it was probably from here to the center of the roof. And, you know, with, with that big of a telephoto lens and, you know, Long-eared owls are pretty good-sized birds, and we just couldn't back up anymore because it was in the trees. So, um, yeah, you're fiddling with all kinds of stuff. Um, and remember, remember what I said about um, s shovelers being actually quite pretty. So I didn't put the, the 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 spot in because it was an overcast day. There was no sunspot. Okay. And then we got a new wrinkle in spotting scope photography. Remember, remember digiscoping with point-and-shoot cameras? Remember what happened to point-and-shoot cameras? They were made extinct by phones. Phone scoping. And same old, same old. When we first started doing this, we were hand-holding our scopes, our phones up to the scopes and cursing when we, when we didn't get good results. And now we have adapters that do it, and the phones are getting better. So there's Sharon Steitler, who was known throughout the world as the bird chick, and she is digiscoping. We're doing that in the rain in South Texas. Um, Oh, nuts, I got the slides wrong. Okay, one of my favorite shots, um, Snowy Egret, and this was the cover photo for the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival. I have a print of that in the back, um, and you can, because people always ask, you know, how good of a photograph can you get with a phone? How big a print can you make? You can go back and you can look at it yourself. Um, more great egrets. That's what we were digiscoping in, in Texas. I, I got the slides mixed up. Sorry about that. That's a common paraki who was kind of hunkered down. That's his nose. That's his eye. That's his eye. There's my favorite duck in the world, hooded mergansers. Dearly love those things. Great egret at the, uh, at the alligator farm. These are all phones. This is all iPhones. Uh, Buff-bellied hummingbird at my house. This one I actually is, is a little bit messed around with. This was Costa Rica. It was in the rainforest. The lighting was awful. So I actually had a little handheld flashlight that I was aiming at him to light up his, his feathers and then firing with, with uh, the phone with my other hand with, with a remote. And then I did go in, in the Instagram app and, and kind of play with the, with the colors and, and punch them up. I, th I think this would make kind of a cool art poster. I just got to get around to doing it one of these days. So... That one, that one has been messed with severely. Everybody see it? This is uh, one of the one of the oil tankers coming in that that same jetty where I took the pictures of the uh, the pelican with the fish and the uh, and the, the the green turtle. Um, when the when the big oil tankers are coming in, we always get the scopes already because the dolphins love to r ride the bow waves, and uh, uh, I just thought that was kind of cool to show you how big those stinking ships are. It's amazing. Uh, just about a half a mile away from where that shot was taken is this one. This is at the place that's called the uh, Port Aransas Birding Center. 
and just a wonderful place for bird photography. A little common snipe just kind of chilling out. I do butterflies. We saw that before. Um, this is a clear wing butterfly, at Rancho Naturalista. Again, in the rainforest, really bad lighting. Scarlet tanager. This is, um, if you've ever been to South Texas in the spring, the birds, the, the, the warblers and the tanagers and the orioles fly across the Gulf of Mexico, land on the coast, and they're, they're, they're hungry. They're tired and hungry. So the people put out oranges and put out food and all that. And so here's the cell phone still shot. And the next one should be, whoops, should be there. Now that, that should be a video. Key the video. There we go. With a cell phone on the spotting scope. Boop. Away we go. Okay. Um, I love to do sunrises and sunsets also, not even if they don't have birds in front of them. So that is the vehicle assembly building where NASA used to build the Saturn V rockets and all that. Uh, that's about nine miles away. This is first thing in the morning. So that's the still shot. And this one, ooh, it's keyed all by itself. Um, one of the things I dearly love about an iPhone is doing time-lapse photography. How neat is that? Look, look, at the, look at the fog going. Look at the birds flying by. <laughs> and this is a cell phone. Can you believe it? Ah, we're having too much fun. We're having way too much fun. Okay, and stop. There we go. Cool. Um, and the last of the videos, I think you might, you might have to key that one. The cell phones not only will do uh, slow motion, uh, um, uh, time-lapse photography, they do slow motion photography. That's a cell phone. And about two years after I took that red pole shot, I saw George Lepp in Connecticut. He was doing a program and I was there with one of our dealers, and George goes, hey, Clay, how are you? I said, good. He said, what you got, anything interesting? So I showed him that video. He goes, oh, can I use that in my program today? I said, sure. So here's George Lepp, who's getting paid by Canon to fly around the world, take pictures with all the you know, super expensive Canon stuff. But George is a toy guy. So he's, he's going through it. He says, yeah, 215, I talk about doing video with your Canon 7Ds and 5D Mark Threes and all that. And he said, so I want to show this. So he, he did all his, his bit about the videos. And then he pops that thing up. And he goes, hey, check this out. I just le learned something new today. And he showed the video and it was on a, on a gigantic screen. And it was like 350 people, photographers, and, and, the, and, the, and they all went, ooh. And he says, guess what? He says, that was taken with an iPhone through a spotting scope. And if you want to know how to do that, go talk to Clay in the back of the room. <laughs> you know, so yes, there's this, some wonderful stuff. Okay. Which is the cell phone and which is the DSLR? Um, these were taken at um, Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge. D didn't move the scope at all, put the different cameras on there. I did no Photoshopping at all on them. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of a size difference in them, a little bit of a contrast and color difference in them. But really, they're both pretty darn good. If you start getting a little closer into it and look at the, s the fine stuff, the one on the right is the cell phone. A little bit more, there's our noise. Um, it's a little bit grainier, clumpier, or here it's a little smoother. And if I go into Photoshop, I can clean this up a lot more. So yes, if you wanna do big prints, the big cameras are really, are, are the best choice. But for a lot of stuff, tell you what, the phones really do a good job. And, and evidently the new iPhone 8 and the new Samsung, whichever one it is, are even better yet, so. Um, the. the the guts of this uh, um, slideshow actually started when I did the Leavenworth bird Spring Birding Festival in, in Leavenworth, Washington. So that, for that festival, I had actually gone out and taken pictures um, the day before and included them in the, into the picture. So this was a spotted towhee that I shot. With me growing up in the East Coast, we have what's now what used to be Rufus sighted towhee, now they're Eastern towhees. So for me, spotted towhees are always wonderful. It's, it's kind of annoying to me. I, in Texas, I have had spotted towhees in my yard, but I have not yet had an eastern towhee, so I'm, I'm waiting on that. A um, little tree swallow up against a, uh, a, a nest hole, nest cavity. Western bluebird in a lady's backyard, and they were just ig ignoring me, which was very cool because I don't get to see western bluebirds all that often. There's tree swallow again. 
So these were just to show the people what we, you know, I literally had taken them that morning. Um, the biggest hummingbird I've ever seen. Short billed hummingbird. Um, and then while we were at the festival event itself, um, with, with our little tent and our little thingies, you know, evening grosbeak flies up. So there's our evening grosbeak shot. And then Caston's finch, and we can blow it up and see the the silhouette of the bill, so you know that's a Caston's finch and not a purple finch. Um, oh, by the way, I want to talk to somebody about uh, what Caston's finches sound like in flight shots. So anyway. A uh, little gamble, uh, California quail that showed up. We 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 spread some seed around for them, obviously. Uh, this is a violet green swallow. This is actually the Nikon D810, which is the 35 megapixel Uber camera, and this is actually the the Panasonic Lumix GH4. And it's really not a heck of a lot of difference between the two of them. Uh, again, not no no Photoshop at all on these things. We see we got a little 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 dust spot I have to take out there. Um, so again, it's 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 find it, find the system and then and then get it set. Um, red nape sap sucker. This was this was on a field trip. The 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 last couple of ones were on a big field trip we had with probably 40 people. So I'm just trying to shoot pictures while while the, the group is moving through and uh, you know not not holding the group up. But the coolest thing. This was at a a little place called um, sleeping. No, not sleeping lady. Something, something, Lady Park is is a is a state park there in, in Leavenworth, and right next to the uh, the main uh, uh, building, the the registration building of the of the state park, um, they had uh, all kinds of rooms and and, and um, cabins you could rent. Was a white-headed woodpecker nest. I mean, literally. 15 feet from the front door of this of this place and so we tried to get pictures of it with the group that didn't work so I came back a little later and and sat and got my first really good white-headed woodpecker shots so that was very cool so that was that was so I, th this this was already part of the, the slideshow so I figured okay I'm gonna so show some th throw some pictures in that I took today because I got into to Flagstaff last night um, so there's the House Finch uh, in the tree right out front of the Flagstaff store just above the, um, the the bird feeders and there were some trees in the background that had some nice color leaves still in there so how about that you know you can um, I was actually kind of I, I wish I'd have known that that you had those feeders there that good I would have been there earlier this morning but anyway um, we went to the pump house meadows in the morning for our little trip we didn't get much I went I stopped by on the way down after in the afternoon so I found a little pied bill greed that I played with um, Western Bluebird, this one was, was on a branch and it was in full shadow with a bright blue sky behind me so I had to overexpose by like three and a half half f-stops to try and get at least some kind of detail on the bird so this is kind of an extreme shot. It, it, was, it would never have been anything I wanted to do a big print of but it was one of those here's what you have to do to get, get pictures. So that, that's where they were taunting me. There were half a dozen Western Bluebirds that were kind of flitting around they weren't letting me get close and I was getting kind of annoyed and then finally, um, this one sat. So that's that's the shot as it came out of the camera. Didn't touch it. Um, one eight hundredth of a second. ISO eight hundred. Scope was about eighteen hundred millimeters. And then all I had, all I did for that was slide mid mid tones down a little bit and bump the contrast up just a tiny bit. Didn't didn't touch anything. We still have the same dust spot in front of his beak and all that stuff. So it it doesn't take much to to get. To, to really get the pictures good, and then my final one, he he posed nicely. So that was my, that was my farewell. He flew away after that, and I was done. So I will fly away and be done now. Thank you very much. Sure. No questions. If if we want to just take maybe five minutes for a few questions, uh, we'll do that. And I was unaware that you took those pictures today at Flagstaff when we had our open house today, so that's kind of cool to see. Yes, Ken. Tripod, tripod does help, yeah. <coughs> yeah, the, o the old photographer's uh, rule of thumb was if you had a 200 millimeter lens, you needed to have a 200th of a second to be able to handhold it and get a sharp shot. 500 millimeter lens, 500th of a second, et cetera, et cetera. Tripods do help a lot with that, but 
the wonderful thing about digital, and I do this all the time with most of these birds, is I'll start out with a fairly high ISO, 2,000, maybe 4,000, just to get a fast shutter speed. Get a couple shots. Take three or four pictures, say, okay, that I probably have a shot. I can now recall it on my screen, blow it up, look at it. Is it sharp enough? Do I, did I get good sharpness there? Am I, is my exposure right? And, if, and if, if everything is good, then I say, okay, I was just at ISO 2000. I'm going to drop it to 1000. I'm going to lose the shutter speed now, so I'm going to have more shots that are going to come out poorly, but I already have something good in the memory. This is what we couldn't do with film because we never knew whether we really got something with film until it came back from Kodak a week and a half later. Now you can, you can immediately review your picture and say, okay, this is good. How can I make it better? Drop my ISO down, go down to 800, go down to 400, and just keep playing, and I'll get more bad ones, like the, uh, the Pied Bill Grebe, the vertical shots there. I was, I was playing around. I had the ISO down to like 400. It was 125th of a second. So when he was preening and moving around and splashing, I was getting all kinds of blurry pictures. But that, yeah, it's the photographic process. It's, it's knowing, knowing expectations. And, and again, um, the wonderful thing about the mirrorless cameras are with the electronic viewfinder, you can preview exposure, you can preview white balance, you can preview everything before you push the button, and as soon as you push the button, it pops it up and shows you what you just took. So you go, ooh, I missed it. You can make a correction and do something and then get your shot. Yes? We have, th we have three different ones. One's for micro four thirds, one's for APS, and one's for full frame. The, 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 the full frame is the brand new one, yeah. And I've got that. I'll, I'll have it tomorrow in Sedona and here at the Prescott store and, and uh, on Saturday you can come play with it. Um, I haven't played with the full frame one much yet because <clears throat> I don't actually own one of those cameras yet. I, I borrowed one from work and it's an Nikon D810 so I better not screw it up. <laughs> um, but yeah, the boss is going to get me one probably first of the year. I'm, I'm thinking about a Sony probably. Yes. Well, with the spotting scopes and, and, you know, direct response to his question, you, you can't have enough shutter speed. It can't be fast enough. It's so I like to do a thousandth of a second or a fifteen hundredth of a second to start with. So whatever, I'll crank in whatever ISO I need to get it there and then, and then start working down once I know I have good ones in the memory. And the thing with the scope is as, 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 I, as I zoom it up, you know, when I'm at 750 millimeters, this is an f 8.6. When I zoom at 1800 millimeters, it's now an f 22. So I'm losing light as I'm getting more and more magnification, which makes my shutter speeds go down while the shake is getting worse. So there's, this is this is death spiral of, of things that can can get you. But you know, again, the great thing is, take 100 pictures doesn't cost you anything. So if I, if I know I've got five good ones, I can take a chance on the next 20, and then I can get really crazy on the next 80. And, and you know, if I, get good, if I get one really good one, hey, that's, that's like my golf game, all right? You know, uh, I'm an awful golfer. I love playing golf. I'm an awful golfer. So for me, a, a, a really good golf game is when I come back with as many golf balls in the bag as when I left, meaning for every one that I hit in the, in the, in the, into the woods or into the pond, I found another one. Um, but somewhere in that golf, golf round, I hit one shot that's perfect. It goes exactly the right direction I wanted it to go and, and lands up on the green. And that's the one I remember. You know, so I don't remember all those 97 pictures that I deleted. The three good ones that I got out of that 100 are the ones that I take to the bank and, and come back with. So, yeah. Um, the, that scope right there is about $4,000. Um, but it's five pounds, it's totally waterproof, it's rugged as heck. You know, uh, go price a 600 millimeter f4 lens that weighs nine pounds. Don't do dare drop it, don't get it wet. Um, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to everything in this world. Um, today when we were at Pump House, we walked back to the parking lot and the red tail hawk that had been out on the, on the, uh, the uh, telephone poles, you know, 150 yards out, flew right over our head. I mean, right over our head, right in the blue, maybe 70 feet up. And I go, okay, this is where a 300 millimeter lens or a 400 millimeter lens would have been perfect. That scope would have been, even if I tried hand holding it, I would, I would have had parts of the bird. I wouldn't have had all of them. So there, there's, there's never any one perfect lens camera setup. Uh, and actually, when I, when I go traveling, I usually have three, uh, two cameras and the cell phone. 
So in Costa Rica, my last trip to Costa Rica, we, we led a tour down there in March. Um, I think with the Lumix, I shot about 1,600 pictures, maybe, maybe 1,700. With the Pentax, I shot about 800. And with this, I shot 2,200 pictures. Just because the phones work really good in the rainforest when something is sitting nice and quiet. Um, so, hey, you know, you, you go with what works. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank mm -hmm. you.